much, Gavin. That was much more detailed than you, did, than you need to know um, for this. It's so great to be here and especially to run into old friends throughout this process. As Gavin mentioned, the sustainable development goals and the process leading up to that has been a tremendous effort by many people, including the great uh, work that Gavin and his colleagues have done on global health. So it's really awesome to be back here and especially um, um, just great to be back at Duke after, this is where I'm gonna admit my age, uh, after almost 20 years. Um, and, and the weirdest thing about this, I have to say, is that I was actually, uh, this was my freshman dorm. <laughs> years ago. It is so bizarre. I think my room was almost exactly three floors up from here. I had that corner room, so I, I'm pretty sure this is it. Um, anyway, so, so really strange to be literally home again. Um, so today, I thought I would talk to you a bit about, as Gavin mentioned, the SDGs, how we got here, what a tremendous diplomatic, academic, intellectual, and political exercise it's been to get the Sustainable Development Goals. And I hope that in the process I can try to convince you that the Sustainable Development Goals will be the development framework for the world for the next 15 years, and help try to help convince you that uh, we really need your help. Um, the academic uh, links with global policy making are absolutely critical. Um, we're going to need your help uh, to create the kind of change in the world that we want. So let me start with a video, because I think this uh, is a great way to describe actually what we want to do and why we're here. So. Okay, great. So this is where we're at. We've gotten halfway through with the Millennium Development Goals. Um, how many of you had heard of the Millennium Development Goals? Today. Great. Press reset Earth here September 26, 2015. So um, the MDGs, as you all know, helped to uh, lay out a plan for what we wanted to do to 2015. And obviously those expire uh, later on this year. And the MDGs have helped us achieve a lot of progress. Um, as you heard or saw, that we've already cut poverty rates in half. A lot of that is due to economic growth in certain countries. Um, but we've also increased uh, the number of girls in school and eliminated gender disparity in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. The global under five mortality rate has declined by more than half between 1990 and 2015. Um, the maternal mortality ratio has declined by 45% worldwide, HIV infections have fallen, um, tuberculosis prevention, malaria, uh, many people's lives have been saved. And I think uh, some people will question, well, is this on account of the MDGs? Is it because of the existence of the Millennium Development Goals that we've made all of this tremendous progress? And I will say um, that uh, there has been a lot of discussion within the quarters and uh, among policymakers about how uh, setting those global standards have helped to steer decisions about funding, about policies that we need to put into place, and uh, interventions. And so I think on the whole, and in particular countries especially, the MDGs have made a tremendous difference. Now, can you go back and say if the MDGs hadn't existed, would governments have made those same priorities and choices? Very difficult to say, but anecdotally, and when you look at specific countries and decisions that they've made over the last few years, it's pretty overwhelming and you'll hear people talk quite, quite a bit about how the MDGs help them make those decisions. Um, people like uh, Bill and Melinda, uh, who are chairs of the Gates Foundation, I think early on they were somewhat skeptical about whether global goal setting can actually make a huge difference. And I think uh, their story is when their 13-year-old daughter came home from school and asked about the Millennium Development Goals, they realized, wow, if my daughter is learning about this and everyone around the world knows about it, um, and that you can basically, in, in India, you can open up a textbook and the Millennium Development Goals are listed out there. That if people know what the services are that they should be provided, then they can more easily ask their governments and others about what they're getting. And so, uh, and those, those kinds of actions can actually help to change policy, policy making. So we've made tremendous progress. But the MDGs also had some major weaknesses and gaps. Um, I think some of you have probably heard about the, the distinction between getting girls in school and making sure that the education that children are receiving is actually of high quality. 
other issues about the MDGs, um, here, here they are, about the MDGs, whether they were, uh, they were addressing the whole range of issues that we need to get at in terms of development. Is development just about ending extreme poverty or are we talking about other types of issues as well? So the MDGs, just a quick review, the first was to eradicate extreme hunger and poverty. Essentially, this was to cut the rates in half, achieving universal primary education. I just did a, a shorthand of this. You can see the icons over there on the left. Gender equality, child mortality, maternal health, HIV AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, uh, environmental sustainability, and this last one on the global partnership is essentially the relationship between countries, northern countries and southern countries to help each other out. Um, but I think a lot of people looked at this and said, well, if this is how we're defining development. It's missing a whole lot of other things in there. And so how do we start to address that? Is development just about poverty? Are we looking at just developing countries, the poorest countries of the world? Or is there a role for development in countries like the one that we're sitting in right now? Obviously, I think many of you know there are still issues that need to be addressed, including poverty issues in this country. So do, uh, should the MDGs or the next set of goals leave those countries off the hook? Does this agenda sufficiently address the needs of all people? So these are some of the challenges of the MDGs, and there are many others. And so four years ago, about three and a half, four years ago, we decided uh, in New York, um, we, the UN and the global community, decided that actually we needed to start to think about what the next set of development goals should look like. And I think in there, we knew that uh, there, in, in addition to addressing some of the gaps that I mentioned to you, one of the weaknesses of the MDGs was that some people thought it was drafted in a windowless room in the UN and then just sort of handed up, handed out to develop to developed countries, uh, developing countries to have to implement. And that it wasn't an inclusive process and we wasted a lot of time in the first five or so years between 2000 when these were generally adopted uh, until about 2005, 2008 when mo most countries started to learn about the MDGs and then take those into account as they did their national planning processes and budgeting and other kinds of things. This time around people said it can't just be a small group of people this really has to be an inclusive process and that we really need to make sure that not only governments all over the world have a role to play and a voice in what they think the priorities should be, but also people, um, uh, citizens, young people, everyone should be able to say this is what we think are the most important priorities. So the UN undertook the most massive effort that the UN has ever undertaken to include as many voices and views as possible about 150 consultations worldwide over the course of three years, including with the private sector, with civil society organizations. Um, there was a survey online, you can still go to it, myworld2015.org, where uh, individuals could then look at a list of issues and vote for what they thought were the most important ones or add in uh, an issue that they, that they uh, thought was missing. Over seven million people filled out that survey. And, uh, and that also helped to inform the negotiations. Now the negotiations began with um, a group of high-level eminent people, um, 27 of them, called the High-Level Panel. All this is to say that there were um, processes to try to help bring in some of the best research and evidence as well. And so there was a report a few years ago to kind of lay the groundwork of here are the issues we need to be thinking. Um, and, uh, and that has really formed the basis of this agreement. Now, when you think about the United Nations, how many of you um, have ever been to New York to visit the UN? Okay, I figured. Well, I really encourage you to do that. It's not as opaque as it seems to be. There are a lot of processes that happen inside the UN. But the UN is essentially, uh, at its most base, uh, basic fundamentals, is a forum for 193 countries to get together to make some decisions on tough global issues. And you can imagine, I mean, if you ever get a small group of people to decide where you're gonna go on a Saturday night or what you're going to you know, uh, jointly decide to do together, it's not that easy. And in particular, if you have 193 countries where they have you know, vastly different cultures and traditions, religious backgrounds, languages, and all of that, plus philosophies about how we should tackle problems, the role of government, the role of civil society, the role of independent voices, um, and different sort of uh, institutional and democratic structures. You can imagine that it is quite uh, a challenge to get 193 countries. And so this process had to be very inclusive. 
So how do you do that? How do you balance out um, the range of issues that you have to address and um, the, the, the need to get something that's relatively focused? Some people will say that um, 17 goals in the end, what was agreed, is way too many that um, this is uh, not as focused as the Millennium Development Goals and that it defines development so broadly that how do you know what you should be focusing on? Um, and, I, and I will uh, address some of those challenges in a second. Um, but so what are the goals? Um, it was a result of a massive diplomatic process, as I said. Um, it is uh, a set of 17 goals that are supposed to be linked with one another. So that, for instance, if you wanted to uh, achieve um, gender equality, you, had to make, you also have to make sure that there are girls in school. If you want to, for instance, address um, violence and conflict, you also should probably address the issues of water scarcity and youth unemployment and other drivers of conflict. That actually these goals are not indivisible and separate in their own separate silos, but actually we need to look at them together. Um, so here's a short video of just, uh, so, so that I don't have to go through all 17 of them, um, that some folks uh, that you will probably recognize uh, have read out. Here are the 17 goals. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere, with no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. When no one goes hungry. When no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has died. The diseases we know have been cured. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed as the We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies foster a new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry, our infrastructure, and our best innovations are not just used to make money, but to make all, all our, our lives better. We will live in a world where prejudices and extremes of equality are defeated inside our countries and between the two countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we can see. Planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the climate change. Where we restore and protect the, the life in our oceans and seas. We will restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people. Work together. In partnerships of all kinds. To bring these goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Let's, Let's get to work. Let's make it happen. remarkable to watch this because it seems very inspiring. You have all these celebrities and it seems like this is a no-brainer. All of these things are good things. But actually when you start to delve into the details of the goals and the targets, issues like open government, making sure that everyone has equal rights, gender equality, you can imagine that with the range of cultures and traditions around the world. These are incredibly, incredibly politicized issues. Not everyone agrees on certain things. Um, and the fact that all countries did finally agree to this is really remarkable. I do encourage you to take a look at the goals and the targets um, at some point in greater detail. 
Um, some people, I mean, so this is a, a talk of the Global Health Institute, so just to say there are others who will criticize and say, well, how did we go from eight MDGs where three of them were focused on health, and now we have 17 MDGs and only one seems to be focused on health? And it depends on also how you consider what you consider to be in the bucket of health, by the way, and as I said, these are not indivisible. Just because goal three is not is about health doesn't mean that none of the other ones will also help us get to the kind of health outcomes that we want. In terms of um, how uh, whether this is too many goals and too uh, expansive an agenda, um, within the United States government, for instance, we have more than eight ministries, right? More than eight departments. So you can almost see a government um, taking on the agenda and saying, actually, there's a major role in, in education for the Department of Education, for instance, to take on and, and tackle. Um, I think the other issue is that, you know, the, the, I was talking about what development is. Is it just about ending extreme poverty? And it isn't. Um, people like Amartya Sen will talk about development is also making sure that people have freedom and justice and other opportunities. That it's not enough for a woman uh, to make sure her kids don't die of preventable diseases or malnutrition, but that she actually wants a good education and jobs and livelihood and, by the way, uh, a safe and secure environment for her child to grow up in and thrive in. So, you know, it, it, I think some people saw it as a somewhat patronizing agenda to just think that the poor people of the world just want to live. They don't just want to live. They want to have equal opportunities to have the kinds of uh, life, lives that you and I expect. And so with an agenda that is only limited to a small number of goals, you don't get at that. And that uh, it's an issue of equity and uh, equality for countries to want more for their own people and for individuals to want more. And in that way, you do have to have a broader set of goals to address that. Um, and I think it, it, it is really important that this agenda uh, appeals to those instincts in us. Um, on the very last day of the negotiations, and this was after three years of hard slog, diplomats who worked tirelessly or you know didn't have sleep they were eating junk I mean the you know the vending machines were completely empty and they were just the room started to not smell very good you know uh, the negotiating rooms and these were diplomats who not only were negotiating with one another but each time an issue came up they then had to jump on the phone and negotiate with their own capitals to say well look this is as much as I can get you you can imagine what a negotiation looks like right if you're, you're both negotiating with the other countries, but also having to go back and say, this is the best that I got, you know, that I was able to get for us. And and so that that was, it was incredibly difficult. And at the end, it came down to a few issues. Social issues, what is a family? Do we include um, alternative, you know, uh, views of what a family should consist of? The responsibility of one country to another. Um, if certain countries have uh, grown because of, um, uh, what they've done to the environment, then what does that mean for those countries that have not? A sort of an equity issue about who pays, does a polluter pay and how does that work out? Who pays for this agenda? Is it just going to be rich countries providing charity and donations to another country? Or is this something where we bring in and harness the power of the private sector and companies and innovative financing and innovative solutions to getting to some of this? Incredib incredibly, incredibly difficult. And there were political issues as well. And here, um, I'll just say, you know, wh who are the poorest people in the world and who do you actually want to, who are the marginalized populations? Are there people, for instance, in um, certain countries, uh, uh, minorities in certain countries that you want to have addressed? And you can imagine there are certain governments that don't want to, to do that. So in the very end, I think we were waiting around for hours to have just a small number of countries address this issue, uh, these complicated issues. And in the end, when it was finally agreed, there was sort of a huge round of applause. And, um, and you can imagine that, and not just in the, that quarter in New York, but on Twitter, Twitter totally lit up, and there was you know, people congratulating everyone. And all of this is to say that um, this massive effort uh, has really brought everyone together to understanding what it is we actually have to do. And so I know that many of you are gonna be focusing your work on gathering the evidence, trying to see what are the gaps, where do we actually have the problems, what are the interventions that work, what are the policy solutions that, um, that are most cost-effective to get us to the kind of answers that we want to see. 
Um, and then how do we best make those things happen? That is all going to require so much evidence and so much work on everyone's part. And uh, the, the work that you dedicate yourself to, I think is absolutely critical in informing global policymaking. The, the politics in New York, the politics of global policymaking is usually about what countries think they rightfully should do. But what is the real answer? What's the sort of, um, what's the evidence-based policy solution? And can we bring that to bear as we tackle this enormous agenda? And I really hope that you will help do that because um, it is a huge, a huge um, set of issues to take on. So what do we need to do to get it done? Innovative solutions, um, taking the, the sort of business as usual approach, doing what we've been doing is never gonna get us here especially when you think the last bit of a population to reach out to is going to be the hardest to reach. Um, it's gonna require all of us to work together, including civil society and the private sector. It means that we're all gonna make individual choices and collective choices to get us there. I mean, I see many of you have water bottles here, grape, really important. You know, there's sort of individual choices you can make to make sure that we have a more sustainable future. But then what are those collective collective choices that we have to make. And I think that has to be informed by evidence and policy solutions. Still remaining are this issue of how are we going to measure the goals and the targets? What are the global indicators, the sets of indicators, so that we can know what we should be tracking to know how well we're making, um, uh, how uh, well we're doing? And there's some, there are many outstanding questions there. Evidence is going to help us uh, uh, address that. There's a whole range of problems around data. Um, I think that the data gaps uh, in terms of quality, accessibility of data, the usability of data. I mean, you can imagine all of you, I see all these laptops out, you've got your cell phones. Every transaction, every interaction that we have is being tracked and someone's looking at that. How do we harness all of this data that we generate for sustainable de development, for, for development and the goals that we have here? That's a huge challenge. There are countries around the world who don't have the capacity to track and analyze all this data. So how can we help to do that? And that, I think, uh, is going to be a big major challenge for us. And there are ways that we're trying to help to do that, but I really do think that some of the great work that you're doing will help us get there. And so in the end, I think, um, just to sort of close, and I'm uh, happy to answer some questions, I would love for, for us to uh, see how can we harness the great work that's happening in institutions like this one to help us figure out what are the right institutions that uh, in interventions that work <coughs> in which settings in which kinds of countries and under what circumstances what works best what are the interventions that work best relative to each other what are the choices that we need to make to put us on the right path for achieving the development goals there's a sort of path dependency so maybe an example to illustrate. Um, how many of you have been to a developing country? Great. And an urban area in a developing country? Have you tried to get from one place to another, for instance, in Delhi or in uh, yeah, Lagos? Or, right. Traffic is a huge, huge problem, right? And there are choices that you can make. If we put in place, uh, for instance, when we're talking about path dependency, if you put in place, um, uh, public transportation systems. There's a huge upfront cost to that, but that actually in the long run, you can address uh, some of the transportation challenges in urban areas, as opposed to just the sort of ad hoc approach and building roads when you need to and trying to just you know, get more cars on the road and dealing with the sort of oil and uh, energy crisis. That will lead us to a very different kind of future. So what are the kinds of choices that we all have to make now so that in 2015, we actually have the world that we want? Um, and I think in global health, there's a lot of those kinds of challenges that we need to make. So I'd love to sort of see uh, what your interests are, how then we can make the gap between academic institutions, policymakers, and others so that we can really help solve these problems together. So I'll stop there and see if, uh, if there are any questions. I'm gonna take the uh, prerogative of kicking off um, and then open up the floor. So you have touched on this before and just to be a little bit of a devil's advocate, get some juicy debate going, hopefully. Um, there are 17 goals, there are 169 targets. Um, it's a very expansive agenda. You're a finance minister or minister of health in a low-income country, you've got these 169 targets. 
you've got donors, you know, their aid has stagnated, they're cutting aid from many countries um, who are graduating. And I, if I was a minister, would be really quite overwhelmed with this agenda. And I've only got 15 years to do it. I'm not really collecting enough tax revenue. I don't have my structures in place. Our health systems are weak. Um, how do you respond to this notion of sort of, this has all got a bit too much and compared to a set of eight goals that at least have precision and clarity and measurability, this has got, this is just a little too much. Yeah. So I think the MDGs were viewed as an aid agenda, that it was mostly on the, on the, uh, the burden was on governments to achieve this. And I think uh, that was probably right when you look at the set of goals there. But this is not just an aid agenda. It's not just about what one ministry with aid coming from a donor country needs to do with that. This is how do we transform our economies and harness the power of everyone to sort of work together? What are the policy choices you need to make? What are the partnerships with the private sector and civil societies to sort of get there? Um, and I think, uh, you know, if, it, if you're a ministry of, did you say finance? You know, so what are the things that, how do you bring in more revenue? And one of the targets, and uh, there's a whole sort of issues around how we finance this, is how do you increase tax revenue in a country to make sure that you achieve this? I think that should be the focus of the finance ministry. You know, how do you increase revenue? How do you make sure that you set and then you work with other ministries? Make sure you put in place an enabling environment for private sector to want to come in, for small and medium enterprises to thrive, to sort of open up the base of uh, the tax base for a, for a country, and then put in those systems and administrative structures so that you can actually capture taxes and bring in that revenue. Um, there are initiatives that were announced on the sidelines of these, of these meetings to help countries build capacity for tax collection and administration and those kinds of things. So I think that's going to be really huge. And then it's going to be decisions of others, government, policymakers, um, parliamentarians, to figure out how then you use those budgets. So, um, I mean, I was saying at the beginning of this, the MDGs were uh, not an inclusive process. So it took a long time for parliaments and others to understand what this was and then to make decisions. This time around, parliaments and civil society and private sector have been engaged. So I think they, they generally know what it's going to take to get done. Um, and so we are hopefully, you know, well ahead of the game in this one. And that in 2016, we can hit the ground running. But I think it's, you know, ministries have to figure out what are those few things that if you work on now, like tax collection, like figuring how, out how you best use aid and on which specific targets you best use aid for um, to unlock. So for instance, if you look at the first six goals, those are essentially the MDGs. Poverty, health, poverty, hunger, health, education, gender equality, water, and sanitation. Those are generally the MDGs. Are those mostly an aid agenda? Many of those will be. I mean, on health, obviously, there's going to be some links with the private sector and the, and the great work that, that others have done. Um, but for the most part, in these other ones, innovation and infrastructure, jobs and economic growth, that is not, there are going to be enablers that governments can help to put into place. Those strong institutions making sure that we clamp down on corruption and um, and, uh, and increase revenue and those kinds of things. But then there's uh, a whole role to play for others. So I think uh, this is not just a government and an aid agenda. Go ahead. Will you take this okay. yourself? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. So um, thank you so much for the talk. Given that these are 17 goals, uh, which would, you know, honorably give a lot of decision anxiety to a lot of ministers, um, first of all, are these achievable in the next uh, 15 years? And secondly, since we're talking about one pool of pot of money, which is now divided from eight into 17, you know, the focus on reduction of extreme poverty, and given that the last mile is harder to reach, how are we going to do that with reduced resources, given that there's the same pot of money for 17 instead of eight goals now? Okay, so if there's one thing that you sort of remember out of this, out of all of this, is that there's not one pot of money <laughs> that aid, this is not an aid agenda. The main difference, so I would say there's sort of three main differences between the MDGs and the Sustainable Development Goals. First is that the MDGs were largely around the social agenda, poverty and, 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 uh, and health and education. The SDGs is about uh, a much broader agenda, not just not dying, but thriving, right? Not just not dying of preventable causes, but actually giving people an opportunity and chance to thrive first. Second is that this is not an aid agenda. 
This is not just about that one bucket of money that is the $134 billion that rich countries give to poor countries every year. This is not an aid agenda. $130 billion is not going to get us anywhere. Right? That, the, that money is a very precious resource, and because it's public funding, it can help to unlock other things. It can help lay the groundwork. So, for instance, if you know that tax collection and you know what we call domestic resource mobility, how do we pay for roads here and, and you know, the basic sort of goods, public goods in the United States? It's mostly through our taxes, right? But that helps to then unlock, if you build a road, then maybe that farmer can get its, his or her produce from one place to another, and it helps enable other things. So the, so the public portion of that is just one part of it. How do you then use that precious resource of aid to open up other kinds of things? This is an agenda that tries to help to do that. To say that actually, as I said, so uh, good jobs and economic growth, that is not something that governments can do on their own. They have to find what are the policy choices you have to make to increase the likelihood that those things will happen. What are the strong institutions to make sure that if a company decides to invest in a country, that actually tomorrow their money isn't going to disappear? You know, and, and or to be sent off to some you know that it's that there's that there's uh, sort of systems in place for that, and you can use public funding to do those things. But it's not just one pot of money. Um, I, I think there was something else that you raised though. Was there? Yeah, basically that um, are these achievable in the next 15 years? Um, considering that all the MDGs haven't been achieved either in the last 15 years. So, and this is where you have to. Um, so I think. I, couple ways to answer that. So it's great to be in an academic institution where really you guys are here to ask the really hard questions and to be critical and you know in the sort of the in the service of finding the truth of course you want to get to the really be, be skeptical and cynical. I would say for now let's um, I think it's helpful to kind of suspend our cynicism and just figure out how do we actually make it done get it done. Everyone in the world has been rallying around this You've got an immense amount of public and political attention, which you would not have otherwise if it weren't as a result of the process that I try to lay out here. So you have, the world has responded and said, this is what we actually have to get done. Don't underestimate the fact that there are millions of people who now understand what this is or are aware of it. I think uh, when we did some tracking around the time that this was agreed, three billion people, we had three billion impressions uh, over three billion of us, about half of the popula of the global population. That's um, that's amazing, that who understand that this is happening. So there's a sort of a political imperative there. Good policies and the sort of the evidence of well, what actually makes sense is really important. But if people don't know about it, then you can only go so far. But right now, here's an opportunity where you've got political leaders, all 193 countries have agreed to this. You have billions of people around the world who are aware of it. So I would say suspend skepticism, your cynicism for just a bit and just figure out then how do we do it? And then we can you know, later on see how well we did. But uh, this is where evidence is really gonna also have to, have to play. Well, yeah. Thanks. Um, yes, I, I entirely agree with you. This is not just a program, right? This, we should mobilize all sorts can of resources. Can you introduce yourself, by the way? I should have asked you. Shen Lan Tang, I'm faculty in the Duke of Medicine and also faculty at Global Health Institute. Um, I, I agree with you, it's not just aid money, it's not just ODA money. Uh, we should mobilize a variety of sources to support the implementation of uh, uh, these 17 goals. But having said that, I would ask you both, if you are the Prime Minister, so President of Malawi, Malawi is a donor driven country. Maybe 40, 50% of financing resources come from donors. How you would uh, you know, do the budget you know, to uh, implement these programs? Uh, how, whether or not this kind of uh, budget uh, estimation or projection are realistic or practical. And the second, uh, you briefly mentioned how to track down these implementations. We mentioned the 17 goals, 169 targets. And the United Nations have not yet made announcement about indicators. A uh, number of the working paper you publish saying each target, I mean 169 targets, each should have two or three indicators uh, being working out, haven't yet made announcement. So over 500 indicators, do you think that you have money and human resources to collect these data? Uh, and so these are two questions. Thank you. Yeah, no, those are really great questions, and those are some of the big challenges. As I said, as I said you know, we're still figuring out what the indicators should be. Um, 
you know, there's people are thinking that there, that there could be 200 to 300 indicators. You just said 500. I don't quite know. But also remember, if you look at the goals, not all 169 targets and 17 goals will apply to every country. Right? So, for instance, we have an oceans goal. You can imagine, you know, there are what, 30 some odd. There are quite a bit of countries around the world who are landlocked. So maybe that's a whole set. So, so not all of them are going to apply to every country. The global indicators are what we're going to use to track at the global level, but then every country is going to translate that into what they, what the, you know, their national level indicators are going to be. Um, but this is where I think the data gaps are going to be really important. Um, you know, how, how do we put into place the sort of capacities and systems to get us to that? And if it's just official statistics, it's not going to be enough. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of questions around big data, but I think you can harness some of that to try to get an answer to some of the questions. Um, one other thing I'll say about indicators is that I think there's some people who look at the goal, the 169 targets. Remember, this is a political agreement. It's not a, you know, they're not um, uh, scientific experts or, you know, analysts who came up with, this, with the goals and the targets. They're political, they're diplomats. And so not all of the, tar you know, they, they measure different things and some of them actually sort of overlap. So I think people are saying there could be some indicators that could address a few targets at once. So how do you find those and then which ones apply to which countries? And um, we'll make it a little bit more manageable. But we all have a lot to work. I'm not set, I don't want to underplay how difficult this is going to be. It will take a massive effort, but already we're on a really good track. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was wondering, so. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I'm second year from Global Health Institute at Duke. So I'm wondering um, for the almost 100 targets, um, for a lot of countries, um, especially low-income countries with a weaker government structure and uh, a lot of money coming from donors, how, how, what are the strategies for them to know how to set up priorities, like which target target on in the first um, Phase or second phase, like what are the strategies from you into a system in setting up like priorities? So there's a lot of support for least developed countries, um, and in particular, I think people know that um, aid is more important in the poorest countries in the world than they are uh, in countries that are emerging economies. Right? Emerging economies have more access to loans, and you know, the private sector may be thriving a little bit more. So that you actually want to steer your aid to those countries that need it the most. So there's that. Um, there's also a lot of support. I mean, the UN provides capacity building support. Um, we already have evidence from the MDGs as to what worked and what didn't in those kinds of countries. Um, but there's still, but I mean, that, there's a lot of attention on those countries and in particular, how do you track and improve data and other things there. But yes, it's a, it's a, it's a major focus of the discussion. So if you actually look at the goals and targets, you'll see they'll say, and in particular, least developed countries, or in particular, environmental issues, small island developing countries like the Maldives, which, you know, we know have some issues. Are you, you're going to, do you want to question? No. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like the sustainable development goals are trying to broaden the partnerships that are possible from maybe the Millennium Development Goals. I'm wondering kind of what are the most, um, and exciting new partnerships that you see coming out of this? Or if there are sort so, of... So, yeah, no, good question on partnerships. So there are um, partnerships that have already been announced around data. The Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data was just announced on September 28th, and that's something that we at the UN Foundation are involved with. That is to see how we can harness and bring more resources to data. How do you harness the great work that companies are doing, governments are doing, to, to fill in the, the gaps and, um, and increase the amount of attention to what we need to have done on data. Um, so there's a data partnership. There are partnerships around maternal and ch child health. People are looking at a partnership for ending violence against children and that it actually, if you, uh, if you put certain systems and make certain decisions to help end violence against children, it'll also have impacts on other kinds of things. Um, but there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk around that and how do we actually make that work in the best way. There's other partnerships as well, yeah. Hi, I'm Henry Rice, I'm the GNF faculty here. In Thanks for showing me away here. Thank you for a, uh, a enormously inspirational talk and your leadership. And I feel like we're giving you hardball questions here, and I don't want to add one more, but I'm going to do no, it. No, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's what university's are for. Yes, that's what university's are for. So, in, in, in translating from your uh, international 
focus to a national discourse and specifically American uh, implementation challenges. With such a aspirational agenda, how does the process play out in American uh, policy and advocacy in an, uh, particularly an election year when much of the discourse is contracting and pulling away from these centers? What are your challenges? Can you, can you um, introduce yourself, by the way? Henry Rice, R-I-C-E. Okay, great. And you are, and you're a... Um... I'm a, a surgeon in medical school. I'm a faculty member here. Okay, okay, great. My husband's a surgeon. And... So, um, great question. Um, I didn't touch on that, um, but this is a whole area that uh, I've been focusing on quite a bit over the last few months. So, in the U.S. context, so President Obama, and this was kind of shocking, I mean, we were, uh, President Obama at the summit where the goals were adopted said that the United States was fully supportive and endorsed the Sustainable Development Goals. And I remember having conversations with the White House way back and suggesting that it would be really great if the president were to do this, but all of us in the sort of community outside thought, yeah, right, you know, that's, that's going to be incredibly difficult, as you say, with the political environment and other things. But actually, the U.S. was a great leader in shaping this agenda. Um, it wasn't as if this is just a UN agenda handed down and now governments like the US have to just take it on. In fact, the US was part and parcel of all of the stuff that you see here. And in fact, I mean, even for instance, goal 16, which is about peaceful and inclusive societies and access to justice and strong, open institutions. Um, that was you know, a huge role to play uh, by the US to get these things here. And so it was, um, I guess I shouldn't have been so surprised um, the U.S. is also committed to implementing Goal 16 on access to justice, working with the Department of Justice to, to try to implement that in the U.S. Um, now, in terms of Congress and the sort of broader discourse in the U.S. about this, um, because the administration played such a, such a strong role, we can, you can legitimately say this is an agenda very much based in American values, um, just like the U.N. is. Um, it's not just some sort of outsiders who are going to come and tell you what to do. Um, and so I think that's been um, really helpful. Um, we were actually um, encouraged by the response from some members of Congress to this. I think they look at this agenda, you know, the Pope was also behind it, they look at this agenda and there is a real moral element to what kind of world do we wanna live in and how are we gonna get there? Um, that people shouldn't be dying of causes that we can actually prevent. That you know, if we were to put in place certain systems and mechanisms to lift other countries, then actually there's a sort of national security argument for the U.S. Um, in the long run um, that you know you make other countries more secure and people feel like they have opportunities and maybe that'll decrease the likelihood that you have conflict and some of the uh, extremist views that have come um, to challenge us over the last few. Um, you look at the refugee crises. You know what are some of the underlying causes there and are there ways that if we were to address these issues, it would help to prevent those things from happening. So there's a lot of other arguments in here that is helpful. And in particular, you know, just to get back to the aid question again, aid, um, somebody had said earlier, a dwindling pot, it's actually uh, last year was a record for how much aid we got. 134 billion, um, sort of a record high for how much development assistance there's been out there. But it's been a smaller piece of the pie, even though the number has actually increased. Um, but what that means is that you know you use that funding in really smart ways to leverage others. And I think that idea does really uh, resonate with the American public. How do you partner with the private sector to increase the impact that you have? Um, and there are partnerships that the US has even led on you know power Africa and trying to make sure there's sustainable energy for parts of Africa um, are really important initiatives that'll help get us there. So I think those kinds of things really resonate with the, with the public. It's been remarkable actually. There's been a lot of support. And introduce yourself. Um, my name is Shama Delkun. I'm a third year medical student doing research um, with somebody in the Global Health School. Um, and I guess my question is kind of about you've talked a lot about how this isn't an aid development goal, um, and so it might not, some of the goals might not be associated with any kind of direct funding. And I think that sometimes when I think about policy, like you said, it's about creating. Um, research and policy initiatives in order to direct um, countries and what they should be looking for without the incentive that often comes with financial reimbursement what are the ways that you're encouraging um, some of those countries to align with the sustainable development goals yeah 
So, uh, interesting question. I think um, in the MDGs era where it was about aid, I think governments, developing country governments, were somewhat wary. You know, are we just doing things uh, on the condition, uh, getting money on the condition that we put certain things into place in our countries? But actually, I think they, you know, um, any government uh, wants to make sure that they can um, thrive and uh, hopefully uh, also try to help serve their citizens in the long run and, and build a better life and so uh, for their people. So I think um, there's not as much of a, when you look at an agenda that applies to every country, then it puts countries on an equal playing field. If the U.S. has as much responsibility to implement this as you know, Ethiopia, then um, actually you're sort of in it together. And it's not so much that um, you know this is an agenda that developing countries have to do, but that everybody does. Um, so that kind of conditionality and that power imbalance, I think, is that hopefully this agenda will start to address. But a lot of these questions that you're asking, incredibly important questions, and right now we're kind of at the critical point of, well, what do we have to do to kind of, um, what's going to happen in the next few months on these things? I mean, at the national level, what are the decisions that a finance minister is going to have to make? I don't have all the answers. I'm just sort of supposing, and you know, but all of this is. This is only three, three weeks ago. So now governments are starting to have to make those decisions and realize what is it that they would want to do on their own, not because some country is telling them you have to do this. I think um, you know you, you can't underestimate the fact that I think a lot of people see there's a real opportunity here, and if they were to structure their work around a set of goals like this, um, it would resonate with not only their own populations but other governments that are sharing you know some of the same challenges. So. Um, every year, the UN is going to be reviewing progress on this. There may be lessons learned that you know, Ethiopia might be able to learn from Rwanda on what it's been able to do, or what other country contexts are similar, so that then they can share experiences. And it's more of a kind of a, 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 a shared burden as opposed to one country trying to impose something on another. Yeah. Uh, to attend the second year, Master of Science in Global Health. What's the relationship between the UN and other regional bodies, say the African Union? Uh, is there any kind of, are you guys talking? And w would it be more easier to have convergence at smaller levels of political organizations, say there will be more convergence in the African Union as opposed to the, the UN? So the African Union actually played a really huge role in this. Um, they came up with something called the Common African Position which laid out what for Africa were the main objectives, and those are all incorporated into this. And so um, I think the next step is how do you take, so we have to translate what governments did on the MDGs into the SDG. We have to translate what happens at a regional level with what African priorities are with the MDGs. And that's actually pretty easy to do because they're, they're already incorporated in this. But a lot of the regional organizations had a huge role to play in. You only get tough questions when people are interested, <laughs> and you've stimulated people, and they're excited, and they're just doing a little bit of stress testing. <laughs> no, but these are all very, so these are all incredibly important questions that I don't have answers to because they're still being played out. And there's no way we're gonna get the right answers to these things if we don't have people asking the right questions, but also helping to come up with the solutions for this. So and we'll definitely have you back in 2030 <laughs> to <reflect laughs> figure out what we do. Yeah, very good. Let's give it a